the ADMA board would like to say thank you so much for coming tonight. And everyone, this is Annette Giannis, mm -hmm. and she's presenting Working with Your Veterinarian. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. So like Nora said, my name's Annette. Um, I'm a veterinarian and a dog musher here in town. Um, before we get going, um, just to know what, what kind of doggy presence we have here. Um, do we all have sled dogs or who has sled dogs? Okay. Um, and I guess of those, I mean, do we have racers, like people that are interested in racing? Okay. Rec kennels, just rec kennels. Yeah. Um, how about tourism? It's okay if there's overlap, tourism and racing. Yep, yep. Um, kennel sizes, anybody have less than 10 dogs? Nice, nice. How many dogs do you have? Beautiful, okay. Um, 10 to 20 dogs? Okay. 20 to 30 dogs? Okay, anybody have more than 30 dogs? Okay, wow, good for you. Okay, okay. and that's your cap, okay. Um, distance, sprint, do we have any sprinty people here? All right, okay, good deal. So. Uh, just a bit about me. So I first came to Fairbanks in 2016. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I'm blocking the slides. Uh, first came in 2016, um, and that is when I first learned about sled dogs. I thought it was an extinct mode of transportation before then. Um, I did come up for the UAFCSU vet program. Um, I started working with sled dogs in 2017. I was working at a sprint kennel for a couple of years before I went down to Colorado. Um, made friends with a bunch of dog mushers and then came back to Fairbanks in 2020, started my practice. Um, and then we started our own little kennel in 2022. So this was our second year running these guys. Um, so it was super fun, highly addicted. Um, it's a dangerous slope for sure. I think I'm gonna stand on this side. Um, just a quick, uh, quick stuff we'll talk about. Um, so we'll go kind of with the boring stuff first. We'll do some record keeping, budgeting. We'll go over some vaccines and deworming protocols, um, some common medications you'll see, and then we'll kind of touch base just a little bit on identifying and managing lameness. Um, this is a very broad presentation. Um, we're gonna kind of touch on just a bunch of little things. I'm trying not to talk too long because um, people get bored after a certain amount of time, myself included. Um, so just a couple topics that we won't cover that maybe we can pitch to our education board. Um, things like emergency preparedness, field first aid. Um, we're not gonna talk about drug testing in races, anything like that. Um, no in-depth injury management. So again, just very broad. My goal is to give you guys practical, useful information you can take back and immediately implement in your kennel management. Um, any big things that you guys would like to talk about that you don't see on this agenda? Feet, okay, yeah, we can talk about feet. So that Q and A at the end, um, I, I I love for that to be like a super interactive Q and A, like really just an open dialogue, right? Where you guys can tell me, you know, what you would like out of working with a vet or things you'd like your vet to know, and then I can ask you, you know, basically like what do you want me to know as your vet and stuff like that. So that that Q and A part, that part, I'd really like for that to be super interactive. Um, and I do have some chocolate kisses up here. Um, to try and encourage some audience participation. However, my aim is my aim is horrible. So who's to say where it's going to go? Um, okay, we'll start with record keeping, and we won't yak on it too long because Tekla touched on it a bunch at her presentation back in the fall. Um, but it's super super important. You know, I mean, the smallest kennel we have here is eight dogs. So with anything more than five, I would not rely on your human brain to remember stuff. So. Medical records, vaccines, deworming, injuries, a training log. Um, I do like training logs for team and individual dogs, um, and then an injury log. And these records are so, so, so important. Um, and I always tell people, you know, step one, take records, but also look at the records, you know, reflect on those records, look for pattern, you know, do you have a dog that keeps, you know, keeps popping up with the left shoulder or something like that? Look at those patterns. Um, and that really helps us as veterinarians if you have that stuff written down, um, if you bring it with you, because then that gives us a timeline that we can look at as well. So whatever record system you use, I personally use an Excel sheet. Um, is a I have a calendar on a wall and then I transfer it to an Excel sheet every every month. Um, Excel sheet, paint and pen and paper, whatever system you have, just figure out what works for you, stick to it and use it, like actually use it. Um, are we all taking records-ish? Yes, who loves their record keeping system? Oh, amazing. This guy pointing at Nora over here. Um, and then if you guys are ever, you know, if we have a couple racers in here, um, you'll see a lot of the time you'll have that little binder, um, little binder with individual dog stuff as well as team stuff. 
um, but all your all your vaccine records should go in there. Any kind of treatments you do to your dogs, deworming, anything like that, um, we should be keeping keeping a note of that. So these are just some quick examples of my records. Um, I think you can see that. I don't know how well you can, but uh, this is like a team log. So this is the month of December. We've got all the dogs, the mileages that they're running, and then it totals everything up at the end. So you can see there was more series runs and more, more rest days in December. And then I've got an injury log. So the dog, the dates of the injury, what it was, um, and then the treatment that we implemented. It doesn't have to be super specific. I don't usually delve into specifics until I get to the, the individual dog log. And I do have this for every dog and it has, you know, date of birth. Um, I do put a quick note on pedigree. I don't get super crazy with it and fit the whole family tree. Um, vaccines that they're due and then any kind of treatments, injuries, anything like that. Um, that way there's, it's a little bit redundant, but I do think there's value in some redundancy in case you miss stuff. Budgeting. Um, money does not grow on trees. And if we all have dogs, we all know how expensive they are. Um, I threw up just some rough numbers for you guys to have in mind, because um, I think it's something worth noting when we're thinking about expanding the kennel, getting more dogs, downsizing, um, just rough costs of having a dog a year. So this, this wellness fund, so this kind of includes your vaccines, your dewormers, some meds, uh, maybe some body work, injury management stuff. Um, and then, you know, maybe that dog needs to be spayed or neutered. So one to 400 bucks a year per dog in vet care, just kind of as a rough ballpark. So that we can plan for. That emergency fund, um, that we cannot plan for, but we do have to think about it. We have dogs, we're in Alaska, life happens. Um, I mean, that's just the, that's just the nature of it. And these, and medicine is not cheap. I mean, we can, we can budget for the wellness stuff, but the emergency stuff, that's where those bills get super high. Okay. I mean, it can be a thousand dollars just for a porcupine quill, or maybe, you know, it can be like a $5,000 bill if your dog gets trampled by a moose. So we should be thinking about it. So do we have a savings fund in place? Like, is there a bank account set aside just for when our dog gets hit by a car? Do we have a mom and dad fund? There's some, is there a credit card? There are some medical financing options like care credit and Sunbit. Those are all financing options you can look at for medicine, but just, just have an idea in place. You know, when your dog is sick or injured, the last thing you want to be doing is like, oh my God, where am I going to come up with this money? So just have a plan in place. It saves a lot of heartache. Um, that's probably my least favorite part of the job is talking about money. So, but it needs to be talked about. And then you do get some fun points if anybody can tell me what my fun little acronyms are here. And these are all common, super common reasons that I see sled dogs at the vet's office for. Probably the, probably the top three. Porcupine quills. I even hit it there. Yeah. No. So it's dog fight wound. Yeah, yeah. Boom. Well done. See, my aim is awful. <laughs> I'll give you another one. Uh, okay. Um, vaccines. So where, where, where are we all getting our vaccine protocols from? ADMA, AVMA, beautiful. What's the AVMA? So I'm a three-year child with a race of Lawrence, so we've got to find vaccine protocols for our race of Lawrence. Yeah, yeah, and that's uh, and that's a tough one. So AVMA is the American Veterinary Medical Medical Association. Um, that's a fantastic resource. I love it. More points for you. Um, <laughs> and then uh, wh wh who else? Where else are we getting these? I mean, is it just what our neighbors doing? Is it what you know our grandpa's doing? Where are we getting these vaccine protocols from? Races. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So pet website. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And where are we getting our vaccines from? Revival online. Okay. So online, online ordering. Yep. Here you participated. Have a chocolate. Good ducking. I'm trying to arc and it's not working. Um, so online ordering. Um, so AVMA is a good resource, American Veterinary Medical Association. So that implies talking to a vet to a degree. Um, I do think it's worth it to just, especially if you have a big kennel, just run it by a vet. Um, you know, I think a, it's different having, you know, it's different when you take your individual dog to a vet versus having a vet that you can consult with on your whole kennel. Um, I absolutely think if you have anything more than like five dogs, you should be consulting with a vet on a kennel wide basis and not just an individual dog basis. But 
they're a good source of information for vaccines. AVMA guidelines has pretty much these three core vaccines. So rabies vaccine, kennel, kennel cough vaccine, and your five-way vaccine. And note that it's a five-way and not a six-way or seven-way or eight-way. So I think there's even nine ways out there. Um, in my opinion, I don't really think those are worth vaccinating for. Um, a lot of those extras, six, sevens, eights, and nines, it's kind of questionable efficacy as to whether the vaccine really does anything. Um, so really, you just need to stick with your five-way and you're probably fine. Um, not all vaccines are created equal and not all vaccines are handled appropriately. Um, I think I've heard through the grapevine of the horror story where Cold, Pot, Cold Spot had a, you know, an issue with handling some of their vaccines. A bunch of their vaccines went bad and a bunch of dogs got parvo. Um, so where you get your vaccines definitely matters. If you're ordering it online, make sure it's a reputable source. Make sure you're ready to like receive that order and it's not sitting on your porch for eight hours baking in the sun. Um, you probably can work with your local veterinarian if you have that relationship in place to just buy it from them. That's probably the most bang for your buck as far as like making sure those vaccines are handled appropriately because um, they are very, very dainty little creatures. They don't like to get too hot. They don't like to get too cold. You're spending all these money on the vaccines. If you're not handling them appropriately, you may as well just vaccinate the dirt. So um, when, you're, when you are vaccinating your dogs, my, my favorite time of year to do it is in the fall. It's not too hot, like in the summer, they're not gonna bake. And then I also don't worry, have, to, have to worry about them freezing in the winter. So we should be drying all up our, drying our vaccines up. We have a cooler ready to go with a bunch of ice packs. We're putting those vaccines on the ice packs. Um, do be careful, because if you have a bunch of ice packs, those vaccines that are on the bottom, sometimes they can freeze. And if they freeze, again, you might as well just throw it on the dirt because it's completely deactivated at that point. Um, so we're going, putting all our stuff in the cooler and we're walking around the dog yard with our cooler. We're not putting them all in a bucket and then walking around the dog yard or taking a bunch out and holding them in our hand or putting them in our pocket. They do need to stay. It's a pretty narrow temperature range, honestly. Um, that's, my, that's my bit on vaccine handling. Um, I think it's good to be ready for a vaccine reaction. It's pretty rare, but it does happen. But it's easy enough just to have some Benadryl on board. One mig per pound. Um, a pretty high dose or it seems like a high dose but you're not going to kill them so just have some have some benadryl ready on hand um, another note on vaccines i also like to be consistent with where i give it so i personally always give my five-way vaccines in the left hip you want to give it in the left shoulder between the shoulder blades wherever you give it try and give it at the same spot in every dog that way if an abscess develops or if a dog's a little sore, we can be like, yep, that was from that was from the vaccine. So I think that's just good habit. Um, and then a quick note on puppies and vaccines. We've all heard of Parvo, yes, unfortunately. Um, so Fairbanks is endemic in Parvo. There's a ton of dogs in the interior and Parvo is everywhere, okay? Keep those wee little vulnerable puppies pretty isolated. Um, I'm a paranoid poly, but I don't like my puppies to go out into the world until they're at least 12 weeks old and they've had a couple vaccines on board. So this is just a sample vaccine schedule. So you'll note that those puppies are getting a bunch of booster vaccines, okay? They really, it's the AVMA requires three. Honestly, with us being in Fairbanks and us having sled dog and being at a super high at-risk population, I do bump that up and I actually do five. And this is the five-way vaccine. The main one we're concerned about is Parvo, um, but there are some other things in that five-way vaccine, but I start vaccinating them as early as six weeks. Okay, I do six, eight, 10, eight, 12, 16, and 20. Um, as they get a little bit older, that's when I'll throw in a kennel cough vaccine because um, they can get kennel cough. Puppies can get kennel cough. And we want to socialize them and take them out into the world so we can do kennel cough. And then rabies, they can get as early as 12 weeks. We don't need to wait until our dogs are a year old. Um, ideally, ideally, we'd be vaccinating them at 20 weeks, you know, less than six months if you really want to, like, be legal and, and you know, approved by the community. Um, adults. So rabies vaccine, that does have to be administered by a vet. All rabies vaccines do. Um, their first one's good for a year. After that, it's a three-year vaccine. Technically, if we can't provide proof of previous rabies vaccine, we have to start it all over again and make it a one-year vaccine. So hold on to those rabies certificates. I hate over-vaccinating dogs, but legally, sometimes our hands are tied. Um, that five-way vaccine is similar if you look at AVMA standards. So the first one's a year. After that, there are three-year vaccines. However, this does vary by races. So some races do require that that five-way be repeated every year. 
Um, I know there's quite a few races in the lower 48 where they actually let you make that a three-year vaccine if it's administered by a veterinarian. Um, I'm hopeful that Alaska will move towards that one day because I, I do think we over-vaccinate our dogs sometimes when we give them that five-way vaccine every year. But if you plan on racing, just be aware of what the rules are. Or if you're running tours, know what your employer requires. Um, lepto, that's also not a core vaccine, um, and it's not something that we usually vaccinate for up here in Alaska, but there are some races that do require it. So just, again, if you're in the racing scene, be aware of what your vaccine protocols are. And that is an annual vaccine that you have to do every year. Yeah. What is lepto? Lepto? Lepto. It's, it's, a, it's a disease caused by a bacterium. And yeah. Yeah. What is it? Like yeah, it can be. It can make them pretty sick. Yep. Yep. So, yeah. Um, yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't know, I don't know if many tourism operations require lepto. I don't actually know about that. I know some races do. Um, I don't know about the tourism one. The kennel cough vaccine, this is where you can get variability because it depends on what kind of vaccine you're using. Um, some vaccines, the immunity does wear off after six months, so we'll vaccinate them every six months. Some of them, it's good for a year. That one kind of depends on your, you know, what vaccines you're using and then also the exposure levels of your dogs. Any questions on vaccines so far? Yeah. What's your opinion on oral or intranasal injections? Yeah, so I love the, I love the intranasal one. Um, Intranasal or oral, um, because both of those are going to stimulate a mucosal immunity, and it's it's a disease that you know affects that that respiratory lining. Um, and usually, the oral or the intranasals are more broad spectrum, so the injectables are usually just Bordetella, where the you know the oral and the intranasals can be Bordetella, parainfluenza, and you know a couple other stuff in there. It's just different. It triggers a different immune response. Yeah. So that when you inject them, you get like primarily an IgG, IgM response. When you do mucosal ones like oral or intranasal, it's an IgA response. So it's just, it's just different. It stimulates different parts of the immune system. Yeah. Good question. Well done. Yeah. Yeah. It's endemic. Yeah, for sure. Say that again. What are your thoughts on the Neopar? Neopar? Mm -mm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so it's just a single. Yeah, so they make single valent parvo vaccines. Um, and honestly, if, if, if we can, like if logistics and, and finances and planning allow, I would say only give your puppies parvo at six and eight weeks. That way the immune system only has one thing to focus on. Um, but it can be hard, like it's just another added expense sometimes. And then if you order 25 parvo vaccines and you only have seven puppies to vaccinate, um, it's just kind of wasteful. But I also don't think you get any less of an immune response doing the five way on those puppies. Yeah. I need to chill on that one. Yeah. No, no. So it's just six and eight. Those are the first two ones. So your maternal antibodies. So you can get maternal antibodies to parvo transmitted through the milk, um, and that starts to, that maternal immunity starts to, or not through the milk, through the placenta, that maternal immunity starts to wane around six to eight weeks. So if you vaccinate at six weeks, you run risk of like maternal antibody interaction, and then your vaccine won't be any good. Um, but there are some, some cases where you don't have that, that immunity is gone by six weeks, and you're potentially at risk. So like me with my puppies, you know, they're extra high risk because they have me around. Um, and so I vaccinated them at six weeks. But I think all sled dog puppies, honestly, are high risk because um, they're owned by mushers that are friends with mushers that have a bunch of other dogs. So yeah, it's just those first two that I do back to back at two weeks. And then after that, it's four weeks. Yeah. And this, this four, this, so initially AVMA was just three five-way boosters. Um, they are speculating of changing that recommendation and making the fourth, making the fourth one, not, I mean, not required, but um, there's some speculation that there's some newer strains or more resistant strains of Parvo out there. And so we're adding in that fourth booster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, cool. Good questions.
Okay. Okay, and then deworming. Um, we all deworming our dogs somewhat regularly. So where are we getting those deworming protocols? Yeah. 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 Is your friend a vet? Friends, how you participated? I'll give you some more. Um, old records. Yeah, old records. <laughs> you just want some chocolate. Yeah, yeah. So it's a little bit of a sticking point up here in Alaska. Um, you know, I'm I'm from the lower 48, from the dirty, dirty south, where there's tons of parasites, and we we deworm everything once a month. Um, Alaska is a little bit more forgiving. Um, however, with our sled dog population, we are we are stressing them. So most parasites don't actually cause much harm to the dog and the dogs do just fine with a bunch of parasites in them. Um, the two big reasons that we deworm them are either zoonotic potential, so some of those parasites can go to humans, um, or the parasites are starting to actually cause stress on the animal. And with sled dogs, we are stressing them because we're running them, we're training them, we're pushing the physical limits. Um, when we stress them, that's when they become susceptible to to that parasite load in their system. So I do think it's worth to have them dewormed. This one is super variable depending on your kennel though, depends on your kennel, where you go, your exposure. So I think that one does warrant a talk with a vet and just being like, hey, this is what I'm doing with my kennel. You know, what do you, what do you think about it? Um, so some common, common parasites, hookworms, roundworms, whipworms, tapeworms. There are different products out there. Um, I guess what products are we using for deworming? Ben, yeah. yeah, Panicure. Yeah, yep. yeah, Pyrantel and Panicure. Yep, yep. What else are we using? Yeah, Prozuquantil. That's a good one. That's an expensive one. We'll talk about that one in a minute. Yeah, do you use anything else with a Prozuquantil? I'll give you a chocolate too. Okay. Uh, no, just only if needed. Okay. Only if you see. Okay. Yeah. And that works too, honestly. I think that works just fine. Again, because we're in Alaska, I think it's fine to just, yeah, you know, if you have a clinical suspicion for parasitism, then deworming. And what are you using as like, you know, if they need to be dewormed? What are your guidelines for that? That's a good answer. Yeah, that's. Yeah, that's a good answer. So that's perfect answer. So some signs of, you know, your dog might need to be dewormed is if they're thin, poor hair coat, poor stools. Um, but honestly, sometimes you might not see anything at all and they might still benefit from a deworming. So um, just a quick note on coccidia. Have we heard of coccidia? No. Has anybody dealt with coccidia? Yeah. Yeah, it's a nasty thing. It's bad. It's bad. Um, mm hmm They've been dealing with it yeah. for a long time. Yeah. And, um, it's tough. We're not doing very good because we still are dealing with that. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough, and it's a tough one kind of, one, yeah, once you got it, like you said, it's hard to clear. It's just another parasite, um, but it can make them super sick. I mean, like just as sick as Parvo can, um, but this is a management issue. Coccidia is just related, not just, but mostly related to scooping poop. So if you are having a long-standing issue with coccidia, that's 100% that's husbandry. You just need to clean your puppy pen more, like a lot more. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But it's hard, especially when you have the larger kennels that are putting multiple litters on the ground. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's common, but it's also not uncommon. So, but that is a management thing. So that's not something we just deworm for, that's something we clean for. Yeah. Nope. 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 They're just self-scooping. I love those dogs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. As long as they don't do it in front of me, I'm appreciative. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so some products, so Pyrantal, um, that is a narrow spectrum dewormer. Um, it is super cheap, so a lot of people use it, but it doesn't get everything. Um, Benbendazole, so that Safeguard Panicure, that is a little bit more of a broad spectrum dewormer. Both of those, you can see the pyrantal you repeat in two weeks. The safeguard and the fenbendazole, you have to do it three days in a row. If you just do it once, it's not doing anything. You might as well have dewormed the dirt, okay? Um, Proziquantil, 
this is the this is the big gun. So it is a super broad spectrum dewormer because it gets all of your tapeworms, whereas that fenbend is all up there that just gets some of your tapeworms. Ideally, I like to see praziquantel in the mix once a year, if not every other year, um, just so we can make sure we're getting those tapeworms. And a lot of the tapeworm species are zoonotic. Um, not that I think you're going out and eating your poop, your dog's poop, um, but there is there is a risk of it, especially if you're like have little kids running around and whatnot. Yeah. Praziquantel. I'm pretty sure it's over the yeah. I'm pretty sure it's over the counter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, praziquantel. And so the, what I like about those too is it's a single treatment usually depending on, on what you use. So like I personally use Interceptor because I'm a very lazy musher um, and I just like to give it once and be done with it and not have to worry about doing it again. So that Interceptor has praziquantel in it. Yeah, but Interceptor is a prescription product um, because of that milbamycin that gets heartworms. So like we don't have heartworm in Alaska yet. Um, Knock on wood, um, but that one is a prescription product. But I like it just because it's easy. I can just give one and then I'm done. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. Do you want to go back? No. Okay. Then how about isn't there some type of a fish pill that kind of can work? But and I again, I'm not doing all these. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Like some kind of a fish thing, fish pill that's sort of equivalent to prosy. Ooh, equivalent to prosy. I don't know about that. It, it's I don't know about that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, like red yeah. cells, red cell for dogs. Yeah. Or, so red cell's or, not a dewormer. No, 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 yeah. Oh, oh, I see what so, you're saying. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Okay, so you're talking about fish dewormer that you're using for dogs. Yeah, yeah. I don't really recommend that. <laughs> um, just like fish antibiotics, you know, because they're usually more readily available. You don't need a prescription. Um, however, that is changing. Um, the USDA recently, I think for the most part, put a band on over-the-counter antibiotics. Um, so you need a prescription for pretty much anything. Um, and that's because, we'll touch on this later, but that's mainly due to like resistance issues. But I have not heard of your fish thing. Yeah. Okay. I see. I see. I would be cautious of that. If you're going to do that, I would definitely do it under the guidance of a veterinarian. Um, a lot of these guys have super, super big, like, margins of safety. Like, you can, like, give them a double, triple, quadruple dose of pyrantal, and they'll be totally fine. Um, I don't know if that necessarily facilitates to all of the dewormers, but pyrantal, I know, is super, super safe. So... Just a sample deworming schedule. Um, you'll notice puppies get it a bunch. Puppies are born wormy. They have roundworm transmission through the placenta and through the milk. So they're literally born wormy. Even if you deworm the mom, they're just born wormy little buggers. Um, and this is where you make a difference with these puppies, right? Get them young, start their GI tract off right. Um, I, I hit them with pyrantal at two, four, six, eight, and 10. Um, pyrantal super cheap, it's easy enough to do. And they are wormy little buggers. And you'll see the worms in their poops. And that's fine. That means that they're dying and they're going through. Um, but they will get them again. So I'll hit them with the narrow spectrum dewormer when they're younger. And then when they get older, that's when I'll hit them with the more broad spectrum ones. Um, adult dogs, it kind of, so it's just it's just super variable. And it depends on your kennel. Um, I, I like to do spring and fall personally. Um, again, we're stressing our dogs a little bit more than the average pet dog. Um, I know there's plenty of pet dogs in Alaska that get dewormed like once in their life as puppies and that's it and they do fine. Um, but we are putting a bit of a stressor on these guys. So I do think there's a benefit. And if you're, I mean, if you're really competitive and really pushing them, you might even add another dewormer sometime in the winter. Or like if you're high risk and you're going to places that have tons of dogs and there's tons of exposure, um, you might just add another dewormer. So, but that there's a lot of variation in deworming schedule. So just warrants a chat. Yeah. So I also do spring and fall. Mm -hmm. and I kind of heard the why was because spring is so mucky and mm -hmm. disgusting. Mm -hmm. and so is that a factor? Is like what uh, is to a degree, yeah, to a degree. I think probably more so because they're like pooping, and instead of like the eggs like 
freezing and then scooping it away, like the eggs probably stay viable a little bit longer. Um, I do like to wait in the fall until the ground's frozen and then I'll deworm once things are frozen. Yeah, yeah. So we cook, mm -hmm. and we get a variety of protein. Mm -hmm. So we try to deworm mm -hmm. quite a lot. Mm -hmm. But you, you said you cook the meat? Yes. Yeah. Cooking kills a lot of things. Cooking and freezing kills a lot of things. Yeah, but like deep freeze, like we get in Fairbanks conveniently. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just kind of just leave it there. And then another like old trick, like, again, I mm -hmm. don't really totally believe it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, the old school way of yeah. sort of dealing with worms with letting them eat um, some carrots. Huh. huh. Yeah, I've not heard of that one. Has to be moose. Can I just give him my hair? <laughs> Not your hair. Maybe caribou or uh, moose, huh. but yeah. that would be all the old timers. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. They that is definitely an Alaska thing, because if you give a dog moose hair in the south, like they're gonna die. <laughs> so it's probably fine up here just because it is very forgiving being up here because we don't have, you know, we have a super long, long cold winter. Um and so our risk and our exposure is just, it's nowhere near like lower 48 dog, lower 48 is gross. Yeah. <laughs> that's fun though. That's a, that's a, that's a fun little, yeah, fun little history fact. Um, just to touch base on some medications um, that we've probably used at some point. Um, carprofen, that's an anti-inflammatory. Rimadyl is the, the trade name. Carprofen is the drug name. Um, Novox, that's like an off-brand, you know, cheaper version of carprofen. Um, I'm a pretty big stickler for pain management. Um, you know, if a, to me, if a dog's limping for more than 24 hours, they should be getting pain meds, not just being put on their house to rest and still limping. You know, I think we should address the pain. Um, anytime there's inflammation around a joint, it is damaging that joint. So we do want to decrease that inflammation, protect those tender little jointy bits. Um, this is not a chronic use drug, chronic use drug um, not in our athletes. If you're using it chronically at all, there's an underlying, underlying issue for sure. Cephalexin, um, that's an antibiotic. So it is a rather common antibiotic, um, 7 to 12 mg per pound every 12 hours for 14 days. Not four days, not seven days, not once the infection looks better, 14 days. The little bugs and the parasites is what's going to kill us one day. Like that's going to end the world. The resistant bugs and parasites. So don't contribute to that and do an appropriate course of antibiotics. Please and thank you. Um, gabapentin and trazodone. Gabapentin can also be used for pain. It doesn't increase the inflammation like carprofen does. It's more more, more so for nerve pain. Um, and then trazodone is an anti-anxiety I put up there because Sometimes if I really want a dog to rest and I don't want them to just go like, you know, spin, spinning on their circle while I'm resting them, I will give them a little bit of a, of a sedative and an anti-anxiety just to, just to bring their steps down. Cause it's hard to rest these dogs. I mean, they're super active. They're super fit. They don't want to rest. They don't want to be off work. Um, but sometimes they need to be off work to get that rest. And sometimes we use drugs to help. And there's no shame in using drugs for that. Um, just a quick note on poops. We all scoop poop every day, right? <laughs> Twice a day? Yes. Nice. Um, and we're all looking at poops. Are we all comfortable with like good poops, bad poops, really bad poops, really good poops? So it makes a difference, um, huge difference. I don't think, I mean, there's more and more research coming out showing the benefits of having a healthy gut. So pretty much anything that's not like a beautiful log, like even if it's like a log with a little soft serve, um, I'm giving them probiotics or prebiotics. Do we know the difference between the pros and the pre's? So the prebiotics are, that's what's essentially feeding the bugs that are already in your gut. That's basically gut bug food is how I think of it. Um, psyllium, that's a prebiotic. Um, are we feeding, are we all feeding psyllium to a degree? Yep, yep. So psyllium is great. Um, super hard to overdose on psyllium. You're not going to overdose on psyllium or probiotics. Um, probiotics are the actual bugs. And not all probiotics are created equally. Um, so that's one where I'd probably chat with your vet and see what they recommend. Because um, there's a lot out there. Um, and some of them are really good and some of them are just marketing. So, but anytime I see a dog that's a little off, I'm doing like one or two doses of probiotics for a couple of days to see if it improves. Yeah. I do. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it definitely won't hurt to do it every day. I think it's great to do it every day. Um, but 
if you're, it's especially like when you start stressing them with exercise or you're starting to throw more meat or fat into the diet, um, I think the gut really needs that extra support once we start stressing them. Yeah, but feeding it year round would be awesome. That's like Metamucil, you know, I mean, yeah. There's the husky stuff, like psyllium husks, but that sounds worse to eat than powder. I take the powder and I sprinkle it over my milkshake with like, like five cups of things, mix it all together and it's totally the powder. Mm -hmm. like right before I eat. But they know. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you mean by the queen. Yeah. Yeah. No. What you got? How about pumpkin? You can feed them some pumpkin, but that sounds like a lot. Yeah. Say that again? Yep, yep, pumpkin. Yeah, it's a source of fiber. So like your fibrous stuff, um, those are all prebiotics. Yeah, and then the pros, like those are the actual little bugs that you're putting into your system. Nah. Okay. Mm -mm. No. Just yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. I would, especially if you see good poops with it. Yeah. yeah. But it's not like you take them off the psyllium and they're like dependent on the psyllium. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, they're not going to go through withdrawals from not having their psyllium. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I think probiotics is kind of weak. Yeah. It's 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 a probiotic. It's not the best is something yeah yeah um so the carson's one i think it's carson's dr carson's um his is pretty good um purina yeah yeah the purina one's good yep fortiflora and fortiflora they have fortiflora sa and i think it's more expensive and it's literally just fortiflora with psyllium so just get psyllium in bulk <laughs> and don't pay for the fancy Fortiflora. Um, Proviable is a newer one too. And I like that one a lot. You can get it on Amazon too. Um, and those are nice because it's little capsules. So you can like shove it down their throat if they're not eating their, <laughs> their psyllium. Dog Zymes, not familiar with them. And there's a bunch of brands of stuff out there, but just look at those. So colony forming units, CFUs. Um, so like we know Proviable and Dr. Carson's are good brands. So like I would look up that label, see what the CFU count is on it, and then compare it to what other, whatever other brands you have out there. And you want a similar, you want a high CFU count, right? Like Fortiflora, you can look at their counts too. Um, what I like about the Proviable is it has multiple strains, whereas Fortiflora just has the one. Yeah. So that's my note on poop. We care about poop a lot. So lameness. Um, so this is the fun part. This is where, this is the stuff that I, I like to do. Um, but we all are on runners for multiple hours of the day staring at dog butts. Okay. So we all have a baseline sense for a normal dog gait. I mean, especially some distance mushers. I mean, you're, you're staring at them for hours. Okay. <clears throat> so don't overthink it. If you see a dog that's a little off, I mean, you know, when I have trouble identifying lameness where I'm like, man, is that dog really off? I'll actually run him more towards the back of the team. So I usually go one up from wheel. That way I can see him or they're like, you know, in the field of my headlamp and I can see him a little bit closer. Um, I have take videos on there and, and videos are great and super helpful and I love them. It's just a logistical challenge sometimes when it's 40 below and you're trying not to freeze your phone and freeze your fingers. Um, but videos are, are, are pretty nice, I think. Um, but if you notice a dog off, I mean, you know, so are we all, have, have we all identified a lame dog? Like, do we know what we're looking for with lameness? Um, so front end lameness, you're looking for that head bob. The rule of thumb is down on the sound. So they're gonna go down on the sound leg. And then the other leg is theoretically the lame leg. Usually, not always, but usually. With a hind end lameness, we're looking for a hip hike. So they're gonna hike their hip up on the lame leg to off weight it. And so we're gonna go up and that's your lame leg. And then like with neck and back pain, that's where you'll see dogs that start might, you know, they might run with their head off to the side a little bit. They might be starting to crab walk. They might be holding their tail off to the side. Um, I think it's great. You don't need to be a vet to do a lameness exam on a dog. And I have a very sleepy participant um, where we'll just kind of run through it real quick, but put your hands on your dogs. I mean, we're all putting our hands on our dogs all day, every day. We do harnesses, we do booties. Um, 
And it, it, that's, you know, when you come off of a run, if you think you have a lame dog, that's the best time to, to examine them. You want it when they're fresh. You know, these dogs are super, super tough. So sometimes it can be hard to get them to say like, ouch, yes, that hurts. Um, so I think right after a run, that's the best time to look them over and write it down. Okay, especially if we have a chronic lameness that we're going to take to a vet one day, that really helps us to know. Um, and it helps for your records too, because you're not going to remember when the dog went lame, you know, what 50 mile run in this Magillion mile series was it that made her lame. So write it down, put your hands on them. Um, I think there's a lot, a lot of benefit to it, especially when you're working with the vet with some of those more tricky ones. So cool. We'll do a little demo. Works for you. So I'll always start with the kind of the neck and the back. So with the neck, you want to go up, so go to the side, and she actually has a little bit of a stiff neck. And so you can see she's more hesitant to go this way, whereas this way she's just like, floop, doesn't care. So she has a history of a stiff neck. So I'll turn their neck, and then when I'm looking for back pain, they have these two muscles, kind of like we do those epaxial muscles that run on either side of their spine. And there's a million ways to skin a cat, right? Everybody has their own way of assessing for back pain. This is just how I do it, but I'll just pinch right along that back. And I'm pinching kind of, you can feel the little bony processes and I'm taking my fingers on either side of that and just pinching. I'm pinching and I'm going down, okay? And you'll see them kind of, sometimes she, she sometimes has a sore back, but if they're a little sore, you'll see them kind of quiver a little bit. They might drop. Um, if they're really ouchy, they are really gonna drop. Um, but back pain can be a hard one to detect in dogs. And then after that, then I'll go to my legs um, and we're just going through all the major joints, right? So we've all done some racing-ish. Um, so we've all seen a vet do vet checks, right? It's pretty much that, okay? So you're gonna go through all your joints. Always look at paws. I can't tell you how many lame dogs I've looked at where it was just a split in the paw is all it was. But you're gonna look at their feet. You're gonna look at your toes. You're gonna look at your wrist. Give that wrist a good squeeze. This is normal range of motion for the wrist. If you have a dog that has chronically swollen wrists, you'll see that their normal range of motion will end like here, just, just from chronic damage to that joint. And then I always go out with my wrist too. Feel all these tendons, is anything swollen, is anything hot? This looks at the shoulder. And when you're looking at the shoulder, you're gonna, I'll, I'll support here, and you want this paw to go back to this knee, okay? Don't go out so much, you're going straight back and that's going to look at your shoulders. I will go out a little bit because that's going to look at your pecs and sometimes their pecs do get sore. So we'll go back, we'll look at shoulder, we'll look at pecs. We'll go straight forward, we'll see if her triceps are sore and that gets you through most, most of your front limb. Okay, so we're just bending everything, we're stretching everything, we're seeing if anything's ouchy and don't worry about knowing like what joint is what. But if, if I, if, as a veterinarian, if I ask you like, oh, well, what, what did you do to make her squeal? You know, you should be able to tell me like, oh, I stretched her like this and she squealed. Okay, makes sense. And then we'll go to the back leg. So again, we're gonna go for our toes and I'm always going all the way down the limb, right? So is anything hot? Is anything swollen? Um, she actually has a history of like, like a little focal rhabdo in this leg where her whole leg just got super swollen. So we're looking at toes. Um, I think stress fractures of toes are fairly common in these guys, especially the distance dogs that are doing a lot of that repetitive motion stuff. Although sprint dogs, that's like a whole other strain on the body. Yeah, those guys are crazy as wild. Um, we're gonna look at our hawk. So I'll stretch this, I'll bend it, I'll bend the knee, I'll stretch the knee. The psoas, so psoas is, have we heard of psoas injuries? Um, not uncommon, um, but they do get really sore there. That psoas, that's, is our, that's our hip flexor, right? And that's a super deep muscle, kind of right here. You can see how it kind of comes together in a little triangle point. And to see if they're sore on the psoas, I'll stretch them and I'll kind of stick my finger in there and you can feel kind of a tight little band. Um, and if they're ouchy, they'll tell you. Most dogs, some dogs don't, but they'll tell you. But that's a good one to like massage too. If you notice a dog that has a little bit of a sore psoas, that's one that they love to get massaged because um, that's a super, super heavily used muscle in these guys that are pulling. And I think that's about it. We'll do the same thing on the other side. So, but it helps to know like, oh, you know, I think it's a front end, lame, front end lameness. She was going down on the right. So maybe it's the left hand side that's sore. And then I'm going to look at this left side. Make sense? 
Any questions? Cool. You can call her now. Very offended. Okay, so we've identified a lameness. Um, we kind of went over, we'll localize it some. Um, some lameness management. So if you come off of a run, a dog's a little lame. We kind of look them over. We couldn't really find anything. Um, rest goes such a long way with these guys. They're so athletic. Their body is so good at like just healing and functioning and existing really that rest goes a super long way. Rest and pain meds. Um, I'll do, if they're really ouchy, I'll do like pain meds for a few days until they're less painful. Um, but the rest just, it's kind of a fine line, especially if you're doing distance running and you're trying to get those miles up. Um, but to me, I mean, if you're giving anything less than seven days of rest, you're, you're kind of missing a lot of the benefit of that rest. Um, and I think active rest is super important, not just like sticking them on a house and, and, you know, letting them do their thing, you know, especially if we know what the source of the injury is. So localizing the injury, that's like huge. And that's, that's where we can like really start making a difference is knowing exactly what that injury is. So maybe it's a left shoulder, like, okay, well, what left shoulder? Is it a shoulder tendon? Is it a triceps muscle? You know, when we can effectively identify what is injured, then that's when you can really treat the injury, rehab the injury and get back to 100% function. So it's not always hard to localize it. Like I said, sometimes it's a very classic like squeak. Yep, it's a tricep. Um, sometimes it's not easy and that dog is still off, you know, two weeks of rest and they're still off and then you're just like scratching your head. Um, and this is where it can get kind of challenging, okay? It can be a financial commitment, time commitment to bring a vet in for lameness evals. Um, it can be unrewarding sometimes because it can take a long time. But then it comes back to like, you know, well, how, how, what's your dog worth, right? So, I mean, we spend how much money, how much time with these dogs, you know, my, my saying is I, I want to prolong that running career as much as possible, right? So localizing that injury and successfully rehabbing it, that's the difference between retiring a dog at like five or six versus retiring a dog at like nine, 10, 11 years old. So, you know, it, it, can, it can pay off in the long haul, I think. Um, I'm obviously a tiny bit biased. So um, just a couple other therapy modalities you guys may have heard of. Um, laser, have we all heard of a laser, a therapeutic laser? Um, I love lasers. They decrease pain, decrease inflammation. They help expedite healing. Um, there's a lot of clinics in town with lasers. Those are the class four lasers, so they're super powerful. You can get handheld lasers fairly easily. Those are usually like class two lasers, so they're a lot less powerful. Um, but I do think they still provide a lot of benefit. Um, I recommend lasers to my mushers all the time, like those class two lasers. Um, the difference is you got to know what you're doing with them, okay? Because my class four laser where I can laser back with just like a 90 second treatment, you know, a couple minute treatment um, with the class two laser, that's more like a 10, 15, 20 minute treatment. So if you have a laser, that's great. Try and work with your vet or, you know, there's also resources online to like how to effectively use them. Um, PEMF, pulsed electromagnetic field therapy. Um, has anybody heard of PEMF? It's a little bit newer, it's just starting to take traction. Um, but I think that's great, um, especially just for like overall maintenance of like healing from an, you know, not necessarily healing from an injury, but like bouncing back from a hard run. Um, there's like different loops you can put over the dog. There's beds that you can like put in a kennel and then lay the dog down on the bed. Um, I do think those are great. Um, massage, I think is kind of underrated. Like you can do a lot with massage. Um, and then I think the best way to massage a muscle is to take it out to full tension. So like if you've got a sore tricep, stretch that arm out. Don't stretch it a lot, but just stretch those muscle fibers and then massage with the plane of those muscle fibers. I think that's the most effective way you're going to get a massage. Um, and I mean, if you don't know the way that those muscle fibers go, there's, there's Google. You can just Google what's that. Or you can talk to your vet if you want to work with it. But, but massage is awesome. I mean, I really, I think it's, it's a little bit underrated and it can go a long way with dogs. So um, best way to manage injuries though, my opinion is to prevent them, obviously, right? Um, and I think some of that can be can be done with some off-season conditioning, um, loose walks, swimming, whatever you want to do. I think there is benefit to keeping those dogs moving year-round, um, glacier tours, something like that. Um, 
core strengthening exercises. There's countless studies out there that show in humans, dogs, horses, that a weak core not only predisposes you to injury, but dramatically extends your recovery time from said injury. So there's a bunch of books out there. There's podcasts. You can work with your vet. There's a lot of resources out there to get core strengthening on your dogs. And it doesn't have to be fancy, okay? But I, I think it makes a big, a big difference. Chiropractic care and rehab. Full disclosure, I am a chiropractor, so I am also very biased in this. Um, has anybody heard of, experienced, done chiropractic in dogs? Yeah, what's your experience with it? Yeah, yeah. It ended up being like a really, not viral TikTok, but it got a lot of views. Yeah. Um, because I was doing, you know, other yeah. dogs who loved it. And I only got like one pop, but my daughter was videoing it and she was on the snow and so it sounded like it was like, <laughs> <laughs> she was really, we didn't really think anything of it. Yeah, so yeah, but now you're famous. It was like 650. Later, yeah. <laughs> now you're famous. Like, yeah. No, it's not but the devil. Jean is yeah. Like yeah. She yeah. Like she's so not magical. She does. Yes. Yes, she does. <laughs> um, I don't know if mine are quite that magical. She has a couple years on me. Um, but chiropractic is huge. Um, I mean, the just basic, basic fundamentals of chiropractic care, right? So. We're optimizing the nervous system. We're optimizing the alignment of the spine. And when you do that, you're basically just enhancing the body's innate ability to heal, adapt to injury, adapt to stress. So some people think chiropractic care is more just to like treat an injury or a sore back or something like that, but there's huge implications of it from like a prevention standpoint. Um, that and rehab, so like targeted exercises, like I have a dog that gets chronic wrists injuries. Um, and I think to, I think it's because he's got some conformational stuff and he's got underdeveloped triceps. So like we're gonna spend the summer building up those triceps to see if it can help with, with his wrist issues. So rehab, Cairo, those are all great preventative stuff, but core strengthening stuff, off-season conditioning, those are stuff that you guys can do at home pretty, pretty easily. And then why do we care about all this stuff? So, I mean, I think, Everybody that's here obviously cares about providing good dog care, um, but I do think it's, it's and I'm, I am kind of new to the dog mushing world, but I do think there is a new era of dog mushing um, that's happening now, right? Um, there's a huge spotlight with social media. I mean, there's, you know, there's just ways to get into the dog mushing world that necessarily weren't there before. Um, and I think just the cost of owning dogs in general, I mean, just the cost of food alone has like skyrocketed even in the couple years that I've been in dogs. So we might not be able to afford those big kennels that we used to anymore. So we have a smaller pool of dogs and with a smaller pool of dogs, we want to manage them better. So we're, you know, we're not compromising that already small pool. Um, and it, it's also a new generation of vets. I mean, not to be doom and gloom, but veterinarians have one of the highest, if not the highest suicide rate in the professions. Um, and that's, Partly our own fault because we're just super caring souls that don't have any boundaries. Um, but the newer generation of vets is setting boundaries. Okay, so this is where it pays for you guys to know how to work with us. So there's a lot of wonderful, fantastic vets in Fairbanks and a lot of them with sled dog interests. So find one that you work well with, learn what their boundaries are, learn how we can work together. It is a two way street. So like you tell us how to work with you, we tell you how to work with us. Um, but it is, it is, things are changing on both ends, the dog mushing end and the veterinary end. So, and I think just in general, I mean, I hear a lot of griping like, oh, well, you know, dogs are expensive and we want to, you know, we want to do the vet care on our own as like a cost saving measure, which I totally get. Medicine is not cheap. You know, dogs are not cheap. Um, but I don't want you to look at vet care as an expense, you know, in a way that it's an expense that we can plan for, but that's an investment in your dogs. Same way that you're buying high quality food, you're buying all the money in booties and harnesses, vet care should be an investment in your dogs. And if you maintain that relationship, I do think you will prolong the running careers of your dogs. So I think that's my spiel. Any questions? Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Are you looking for any sprint 
<laughs> I would love to actually, because I mean, uh, sprint is just so intense. Like that's where I think chiropractic care can like really make a difference because you want every single muscle fiber firing like all the time. Um, sprint dogs are hard though. <laughs> they're hard for me to adjust because they're very boingy <laughs> and they don't always stand well. Um, but yeah, I, I would love to for sure. Yeah, yeah. Did yeah. My very best, most important yeah. job in the entire kennel. No. I've got a shoulder thing this year. No. And shoulders um, are tough. Luckily, well, thankfully, um, Remy Cost's wife, Lily. Yeah. yeah. She's an osteo mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. therapist and does a bunch of stuff. And she worked mm -hmm. on her shoulder yeah. a lot, but she worked on her whole body. Mm -hmm. Um and then we rested her a lot. Mm -hmm. But she's one of those ones I probably should have given her some kind of. There's no shame in drugs. Relaxer. Yeah, like no shame in drugs. It's hard. Yeah. Intense. Yeah. And then you're resting them so they're like way more and I was rest yeah. yeah. And I yeah. rested her and rested yeah. her and rested yeah. her. And then yeah. finally, and it still, I plugged her back in and yeah. it was just still too much. So yeah. I'm hoping that. My next fall, she'll be yeah, yeah. and give her a just trying now. to do whatever I can over the summer to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh yes. I'm waiting. For <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. as far as like joint supplements, mm -hmm. is there any you would recommend, or mm -hmm. when like age wise, when you would you yeah. start them and kind of. So I've been, the, like thinking about that. Yeah, the age one is, you know, is there an age? I don't think you can ever just... start it too young. Yeah. Um, omega threes are huge. Um, just plain Jane omega three supplementation. So like fish oil, krill oil, that kind okay. of stuff that you can like just put in a bucket and feed to the yard. Um, that's a good one. Dasequin. Have you heard of Dasequin? Dasequin's a chew, um, and that one has like a lot of research behind it, and it's good. Um, but there has been studies that have shown that omega threes are actually better than Dasequin. So I've been recommending a ton of omega threes. Okay. Um, Adequan. Has anybody heard of Adequan? So that's an injectable joint supplement. It's kind of spendy. It's a little bit expensive, um, but that can make like if we're if we actually have some joint pathology that we know of, like if we know we have a slightly arthritic knee. Um, or like sometimes for necks, I think they get, I just banged my microphone, sorry. Um, and sometimes they get a little bit of arthritis in their neck. I think Adequan can help with that. So that's an injectable joint supplement. Um, but really, I, I would say probably the simplest one is your omega-3s. And you can go, you can like Google um, CSU fish oil chart. So Colorado State University fish oil chart. And they oh, okay. have like straight guidelines on how to dose it because it's high dose omega-3s is what you want. Yeah. Okay. Um, I had somebody who had suggested, who had a friend suggest to them, mm -hmm. um, they just buy at Costco and it's human grade mm -hmm. and yep. like and just for chondroitin yep. or MSN. Like, so the chondroitin and the MSM, I and think. that's what I was. Yeah, I think there's not a whole lot of bioavailability on that one. Okay. Um, and like the Cosequin that you get from Costco, like, you know, it might be okay, but like I've. I don't know, it's probably not doing much because just because that oral bioavailability isn't there. But that's what I like about Dasequin. The Dasequin does have some research backing behind it to know okay. that it works. Um, so that's the hard part with supplements is it's not FDA regulated. So like you can slap a label on a bag and say it's the best thing since sliced bread. And like you are allowed to say that. Um, so I try to go with more of the research backed ones. Um, so Adequan's a good one. Dasequin's a good one. But omega-3s are also pretty good. Okay. Um, yeah. Can you, because she had also said they were getting a little pill form mm -hmm. of the krill or mm -hmm. the fish oil mm -hmm. and the human grade at mm -hmm. Costco. You can. Yeah. Yeah. It got, all goes them. down to those omega-3s, man. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just different versions of the omega-3s. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. I have a question. Yeah. So our dogs are free running mm -hmm. and every once in a while, one of them will have you know, a normal poop with some pudding. Mm -hmm. We haven't changed anything. We're not sure mm -hmm. what's going on. You think the psyllium? I think, yeah, probably... I think, yeah. So those are instances where like, yeah, if I just have like one off bad poop or something, I would totally give some psyllium or pumpkin, whatever they're going to eat. Um, or even just right. some probiotics. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, mm -hmm. just for a couple of days until the poop normalizes. Yeah. yeah, maybe it's just like they, you know, ate something, snuffed something off the ground, or the gut bugs are a little off. But mm -hmm. yeah, I think it helps to benefit, of, you know, to su support them a little bit in that. Mm -hmm. You know, is it going to kill them to have soft poops for a couple of days? Probably not. Mm -hmm. um, but it bugs me and it's harder to scoop. So I'm going to do something about it. Thank you. Yeah. I was going to say, here's a trick for your picky dog <laughs> who won't eat that stuff on their food. If they don't eat it today, it's like kid, right? <laughs> They'll probably be a little hungrier tomorrow. They, <laughs> then, then the fourth day, they'll eat. <laughs> You're an analogy. So eventually, they'll eat, right? <laughs> I mean, I, I got hounds, so they'll eat anything all day long but picky kid maybe you know <laughs> you run malamutes though yeah yeah they'll starve themselves out yeah 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 they'll, they'll, they'll starve themselves out and protest for sure can i ask like a specific injury type question sure. of, i don't know so, if i can answer it but sure well yeah. i'm yeah. I haven't seen this with my own dogs, but I have a dog that I'm like babysitting and potentially breeding over the summer mm -hmm. that got basically what's bog spavin in Iditarod. Oh, mm -hmm. So that swelling mm -hmm. in the hawk. Mm -hmm. And one of the. This is your hawk. Yeah. And yeah. one of the, um, like yeah. Jessica Kletchka was mm -hmm. saying that she's seen it a lot and mm -hmm. kind of like mm -hmm. those long distance running dogs. What, mm -hmm. yeah. have you seen that? What is it? I have, and I think that's just concussive forces. I mean, it's repetitive motion injuries, right? Yeah, it so. is bilateral. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's bilateral yeah. too, yeah. Which is odd. Yeah, has it been x-rayed? No. Okay, yeah, it might be worth an x-ray. I don't, I don't know about it as much in dogs. I do some horse medicine as well, um, but sometimes that can be related to like OCD lesions, um, which is just a bony mm -hmm. def defect. Um, but I'd be, I'd be a little bit concerned about breeding that if it's bilateral um, and it's a chronic issue. Yeah. I can't say for sure whether there's a genetic component to it, um, but I just, I don't know that I'd take the chance. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. I guess I have questions for you guys though. Yeah. Like as a veterinarian, and I, I really am truly interested to hear feedback, but like, what are you looking for in a vet? Like how can I come in to support you? What would you like us to know as veterinarians and working with dog mushers? Nothing's off the table. Don't say work for free. <laughs> yeah. And it's tricky. It's hard. Medicine's hard. It's not straightforward. So, yeah, there's a lot of times where I do say, I don't know. But we can figure it out sometimes, and sometimes we can't. Yeah. I think kennel planning, like you've been talking about, is yeah. so important. Mm -hmm. Like when I first got started, I would like yeah. schedule like a lameness exam and ask a billion and a half questions yeah. just about the kennel. Yeah. Um, and so what you're doing is yeah. super smart by being able to go to kennels. And I think there are actually more veterinarians that do it yeah. and they just need to be asked. Yeah, for sure. You just need to be asked. And like, again, there's, there's so many amazing vets in Fairbanks and there are so many of them that love sled dog work. Um, like you can find a vet that you can jive with because there is a difference between taking your dog, a, a dog to a vet um, and there's a difference between having a kennel vet and a rapport with the vet where you can be like, hey, you know, our poops are a little soft, you know, can I just give them some probiotics? And it's like, oh, yeah, that sounds good. Um, but yeah, doing that kennel management, for, for me, the way that looks is just going out to your yard once a year. We chat. I know you. I know your dogs. And then I feel comfortable doing like tele-advising, authorizing scripts, stuff like that. But again, that goes back to every vet's different. So when you find one that you like, you just, you, you figure out you know, how to keep that. It is a two-way relationship. So how to just keep that going and what works for every vet. Yeah. Yeah. So with vets that are mobile, is there say like a flat rate or a, mm -hmm. a what do you call it? A travel fee. A travel fee. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Because gas is expensive. Oh yeah. Yes. And I, I, I only speak for my, my own personal practice. Um, but yes, I do charge a travel fee because gas is very expensive. Yes. What? So um, my vet, you know, I go mm -hmm. to her and mm -hmm. she doesn't come out there. Mm -hmm. So what is kind of the range price-wise? Like, to like for my travel yeah. fees, um, <clears throat> if you're like within 30 minutes or so of Fairbanks, um, it's about 75. Um, 
but it's it's kind of fluid because if I can like group appointments together by like geographical location, um, then I won't like if I if I'm going out to two rivers for like one call, then that travel fee can be like 150 bucks because I'm going pretty far. Um, because it's not just the gas, it's also like my time in the truck. Um, but if I like schedule a full two rivers day, then everyone just gets the minimum, which is like 65 to 75 bucks. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. I have a question about um, mosquitoes. Yeah. So I have one dog. This is the second year in a row where they attack the top of her nose mm -hmm. and her whole face swells. Mm -hmm. So I, I've had advice from half of my friends in this room. Yeah. So I put that horse spray, but Swat. I wiped it on there. Yeah. And then I used Benadryl gel. And then last yeah. night I gave her Benadryl. But she's, she's already blowing up. Still miserable. Yeah. Yeah. There is a product... Um, like, so like Laura 48 does those like flea tick products, like the topical stuff. And some of those can be okay for mosquitoes. Um, the one I tried, cause I had a dog that was also super sensitive was called Vectra, I think. Um, it's kind of pricey, um, but and it's just a topical that you put on. And that has a little bit of mosquito repellency that you don't have to repeat every day. Okay. Um, but it's tough, it's tough being in Alaska. I like, have you tried the SWAT cream for horses? It's like a thick, no, not yet. Do, yeah. Swat. Swat. Yep. All right. Like we're going to swat the mosquitoes away. Do you think I, I can get it cold? Yeah. Do you, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I'll yeah. try it. I'll try anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Do they have like things that you can hang somewhere? Like, mm -hmm. like if you have a baby and stuff, you know, or if you're picnicking, you can put it and it's, I don't know, it's not the mosquito magnet, but it's a thing. Mm hmm yeah, and those seem to work too. Thing. Like then, just preventing yeah. them yeah, from even rough. coming She's in. Just the, sensitive. The mosquito from. Yeah. Coming Do you give her oral Benadryl? To... I did last night, yeah. but I didn't. Give her How much? That. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah I'm yeah. learning. You can probably give her like three pink pills if she's a Malamute. Yeah, I only gave her one. Yeah. Yeah. No, that you got. Okay, I'll give her three tonight. <laughs> <laughs> one milligram per pound. That's okay, the that's good to know. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, any other feedback for me as a vet? Yeah. Just to tag on to the mosquito, have you mm -hmm. seen, like, can you use Loratadine, Claritin? Um, I've that? not used Claritin. I've used Zyrtec before in dogs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Does I think. Does seem to work? For... Eh, I think the Benadryl, the, in my hands, the Benadryl seems to work better than the Zyrtec. Um, but, I, I mean, I think it would be safe. Yeah, I think it would be safe to use. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we're cool. wrapping things up. And thank you so much, Annette, yeah. for your time. Yeah, you're most welcome. <laughs>